16 this evening for our message from God's Word. Judges. Well, we are in Corinthians in our Sunday evening study, but this is part of uh, part two of a message we started last Sunday night. And in Corinthians, we've made it through the first three chapters and uh, getting into the meat of chapter four. And we found there in 1 Corinthians 4 that, that one of the things that they're rebuked for is getting puffed up. And they're getting puffed up and they're thinking of themselves above that which was written. So probably next week we'll get back into 1 Corinthians 4 and break more of that down. But they're getting puffed up uh, with themselves above that which was written because they're taking credit for uh, the things about them that cause them to differ from other men. Their difference, their abilities, their strengths uh, that they have, their gifts that other men don't have, rather than attributing them to the power of God who gave them those gifts, rather than attributing and crediting the God who, who uh, endowed them with those gifts and talents and abilities, they just think it belongs to them. They're thinking, they're attributing their talents and abilities and powers to, to themselves and, and their, own, uh, their own nature. Uh, and really, we found last week, that, and we focused last week, on Samson really being a prime example of that. And uh, a lot of these New Testament doctrines are just so perfectly illustrated with Old Testament history. They just go together so well. When you preach the Old Testament, there's, a, there's just a doctrine that that story seems to point to. And when you preach a New Testament doctrine, it just the illustrations are right there for you. You don't have to think of funny, interesting anecdotes from your own life. If you have one readily, that's great. But the, the illustrations are right there in the Word of God. And Samson's a great illustration for this. He's given physical strength above anyone I've ever met, anyone else I've ever heard of. He, he was given power and strength, but it was taken from him. He was armed with power, but tragically disarmed. And why, why was he disarmed? Why did he lose the power? Because he was puffed up and thought of himself above that which is written and, and failed to attribute his strength to God. You know, he, he's thinking that the hair is a magic genie. Like hair is just an object. Hair can't decide to give you power. It's the God who made his hair that gave him the power. And he seemed to, to miss that. Uh, and so... God is able to withdraw that power if he wants. God is able to withdraw power and withdraw strength. And God endows man with gifts and abilities and things that make them differ from other men. But he can take them if he wants to. He can take those things from us. And, and we have to keep that in our mind that that's the source of them. And so we began last week by noting that Samson was dis his disarmament, his loss of power. It happened because he got hooked. He got hooked on something he shouldn't have got hooked on. He got addicted to someone and something he should not have gotten addicted to. He was hooked, number one, despite a vow. He was supposed to have pledged, and God's plan for him, given by an angel of God, was that he was supposed to have made a vow that, based on history, he, he didn't, we don't have any example of him actually making that vow. And we've got no, we've got continual evidence of his, of his not keeping or, or not accomplishing the things that the vow was supposed to promise. And so, why? Because he's hooked, and he's hooked by, despite a vow, he's hooked by Delilah. He's hooked by this woman, and, and he's hooked by misplaced love. We talked about that last week. When we, when man, when Christians, when we put, when we love what we're not supposed to love, when we love something or someone that God says not to, it's always going to come back to bite us. It's just always going to come back to bite us in the end. You cannot possibly do that and expect to retain the power of God. Well, we have to be careful about what we, love, what we love. We've got to be careful about our affections. We've got to be careful uh, what we embrace because if it's the wrong things that are forbidden, we're going to lose some power. We're going to lose something. If something's going to be taken from us, uh, we're told to be armed with the mind of Christ. In 1 Peter 4, to be armed with the mind of Christ. You cannot have the mind of Christ and be frequenting the bedchamber of a strange woman. Being there shows you don't have the mind of Christ. So there's this disarmament where, where Samson's power is, is taken from him, and it's a great tragedy, but there's so much to glean from it. So we'll go back to Judges 16, and we'll stand as we read. We're, we read verses 4 through 21 last week. We're going to read those same verses again because we'll draw our truths and principles uh, directly from this passage. Very interesting, the things that took place. We started breaking it down last week. We'll finish that this week. Judges 16, verse 4, And it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. And the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and said unto her, Entice him, and see wherein his great strength lieth, and by what means we may prevail against him. 
that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will give thee every one of us eleven hundred pieces of silver. And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength. See, you have to use that kind of, as you read, you have to picture her uh, suggestive voice, maybe her whiny voice, or, or the wiles of her feminine charm. I'll not reproduce, I'll leave that to your own heads, all right? But it's there. Uh, I tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lieth, and wherewith thou mightest be bound to afflict thee. And Samson said unto her, If they bind me with seven green widths that were never dried, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green widths, which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now there were men lying in wait, abiding with her in the chamber. And she said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he brake the widths as a thread of toe is broken when it toucheth the fire. So his strength was not known. And Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If they bind me fast with new ropes that never were occupied, then shall I be weak and be as another man. Delilah therefore took new ropes and bound him therewith and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And there were liars in wait, abiding in the chamber. And he brake them from off his arms like a thread. And Delilah said unto Samson, Hitherto thou hast mocked me and told me lies. Tell me wherewith thou mightest be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web. And she fastened it with a pin and said unto him, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awaked out of his sleep and went away with the pin of the beam and with the web. And she said unto him, How canst thou say I love thee when thine heart is not with me? Thou hast mocked me these three times and hast not told me wherein thy great strength lieth. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. Then he told her all his heart and said unto her, There hath not come a raider upon mine head. For I have been a Nazarite unto God from my mother's womb. If I be shaven, then my strength will go from me, and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he hath showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought money in their hand, and she made him sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man, and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. And she said, The Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And he awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times before and shake myself. And he wist not that the Lord was departed from him. But the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass. And he did grind in the prison house. Heavenly Father, there is so much in this passage that you filled it with for us to, to absorb and to be instructed by, to take in, to heed. Help us to see a negative example to learn from it. Give us the wisdom not to make the mistakes that this man made. Lord, we, uh, we, just, we see, Lord, we just sang about we've been uh, broken free from chains in Christ and the chains of our sin have burst asunder and here's a man who's, who's locked and chained. And Lord, may we see the connections here. Help us to walk in your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The tragedy of disarmament and how that happens. We gave you the first point last Sunday night. So here's point number two uh, for this evening. Imagined invincibility. How does our power go from us? How do we lose God's power? Imagined invincibility. We, we think that we're invincible when we're not invincible. We, we think uh, that we're uh, above and beyond ever losing it. That's part of being puffed up. It's part of thinking of ourselves above that which was written. When we get filled with pride, we think that we could, nothing's ever going to hurt me. Nothing can touch me. Nothing's ever going to, this, this isn't going to hurt me. This isn't going to cause any problems. There's a naivety. Pride and naivety go hand in hand. When you're filled with pride, you just don't think anything can stop you. And that's a very naive thing. And you perceive everything else as, I can handle that. That's nothing for me. When, when you attribute your strength to yourself and you're welled up and puffed up and filled with pride, you, don't, you, you, you think you're above and beyond falling. And Samson is the epitome of a one-man band. Samson is a one-man band. Samson was so filled with pride, he thought he could do everything on his own. He's a rogue. There was no accountability in his life. It's no coincidence that he continually fell to temptation. One of the key principles in being strong in the face of temptation, one of the key secrets uh, and ingredients to, uh, to withstanding the temptation to sin is accountability. We've got to make ourselves accountable. We've got to be around other people. One of my favorite series of messages that God has allowed me to preach was last year. We had 10 Sunday nights in a row focused on this matter of temptation and withstanding it and what God says about 
temptation. And one of the things that we saw in that study is that accountability and having somebody around deliberately and purposely to keep you accountable, that's going to strengthen you against temptation. It's going to provide and equip you uh, with ways that, that you're a lot less likely to fall to that temptation, a lot lessly, less likely to indulge in that sin because you've deliberately put yourself in a position where there's, there's people that will hold you accountable to doing right. And, and Samson failed to do that. And there's so many examples in Scripture about that. You know, Lot, when he split ways with Abraham, he started making poor decisions. And, and Abraham had a good effect on him. When Lot and Abraham were together, he was a whole lot better off. When he leaves somebody, the leaves off the presence of somebody who helped him stay accountable, it got bad fast for Lot. You think of uh, some others in Scripture, Potiphar's wife in the book of Genesis. When, when was it that she threw herself at Joseph? When the house was empty. No, I, I, All alone. No accountability at all. Same as the woman of Proverbs 7 who entices that simple man in, into down into death and hell, and she flatters him and seduces him. When does she do that? The good man of the house is not at home. Just like Mrs. Potiphar, the good man of the house isn't here. Nobody will see us. There's no accountability there. You think of David and, and the great sin of David's life, the sin with Bathsheba. And, and when uh, the timing is significant because that sin with Bathsheba took place after Jonathan had died. Not long after Jonathan had died, Jonathan, his best friend, and part of the, the beauty of their friendship was that Jonathan helped keep David accountable. And it's no coincidence that when Jonathan dies, that's when David falls. He lost his accountability partner. You think of Aaron and Moses. Well, you know, Aaron had some low lows. He made a golden calf for people to worship. When did he do that? When Moses was away. Moses was up on Mount Sinai. And Moses helped, you know, when Moses is around, Aaron's doing a whole lot better. Moses is around for most of Leviticus. When Aaron is given the honor of fulfilling the, these offices and their pictures, but that's a, a whole different cry from the way Aaron was when Moses had gone up to Sinai. Accountability. Woe to him. Ecclesiastes 4. We, we looked at that when we talked about this, that two are better than one. And one of the reasons Ecclesiastes 4 lists for, for two being better than one, it says, woe unto him who is alone when he falls in particular into temptation. And many fall to temptation because they were alone, because they did not have accountability present. And so often falling to temptation is owed in part to unnecessary isolation. When we're distanced and isolated and there's no one to keep us accountable. And, and Samson was that way. We see that for 20 years, Samson judged Israel. We don't hear a thing about any of the officials that he worked with, it's a large nation. He is the judge for 20 years. The judge is the chief official, and it's not a president. It's not a king. It's not necessarily an executive office, but there is a role in war that the judges had. And it's also, it's judicial, literally a judge meeting out justice for all of these people. He's at the top of this uh, of a system of justice. Are there not delegates? Are there not subordinates? Does he not have people to report to him. We know nothing about how he arranged any of that. We know nothing of anyone he actually worked closely with. He's not involved with anybody. He's simply a rogue. There's not a single instance we find in Judges 14, 15, 16 of Samson ever even assembling the armies of Israel. And we know they were ready to be assembled. Only a few chapters later, there's armies. But not one time did he call them together. He thought he could fight every battle by himself. Because when you're filled with pride, you think that you can handle anything whatsoever on your own, and you don't think you need any help. And it takes some humility to say, I need some help. I need a team. And Samson is always alone, always fighting battles all by himself, him against the world. You can't do it all alone. It's just not sustainable. You might get a victory or two on your own, but it's not going to last. We, we need each other. That's part of the reason God instituted the church. You can't fight all the things you've got to fight by yourself. You need some help. You, we need to help each other fight our battles. Yesterday I was uh, out in the front yard and Brother John drove by. And I appreciate it. He didn't just drive and wave. He turned around and swung in. And we spent 30, 40 minutes chatting in the front yard spontaneously. And it was a blessing. And I got to tell you, we, we talk about when we get together, we talk about our weaknesses a little bit. We talk about our struggles. And we talk about our victories. And man, that helped me, brother. You helped me. And I just, I just love that. That Why? Because of church. Because of God's church. And I know sometimes there's people in here that get together and I don't even know about it.
But one of you is trying to minister to somebody else and trying to be there for somebody else. You know what you're doing? You're lifting up their arms. Moses uh, lifted up his arms over the battle against the Amalekites. And when his rod is lifted up, his arms are lifted up, there's victory for Israel. But he couldn't keep his arms up alone all day. He needed help. He needed Aaron and her to come and say, you're getting tired. Let me give you a boost. Let me help you. Let me hold these up for you. Suppose Moses had been Samson and had said, I don't need any help. Well, eventually you're going to need help. And I know Samson had this great strength and he carried gates up a hill, but you can't keep fighting battles on your own forever. And he found that out. And imagine, Moses, I don't need you. What's going to happen? You're going to get tired. Your arms are going to go down. And there's victory is going to be lost and defeat is going to be had. And lives are going to be lost in the battle because of his pride. Because he couldn't just admit he needed some help. He needed, you need each other. You need somebody in your life. If only Samson had his Jonathan. How much more greatness would we see? How much more victory would there be? How much less tragedy would there be in the book of Judges if only Samson had, had a Jonathan that stayed nearby and kept him accountable? It, it doesn't seem that Samson made any effort at all to invest in the people that he led. And the marks of great leaders are that they, they understand the people they lead and they minister to the people they lead and they invest in the people they lead. And, and there's a mutual relationship where the people help the leader lead and they, under, they love each other. And there's a reciprocal uh, investment in love. That's good leadership. That's the kind of leadership that Jesus left a pattern for and demonstrated. And it's totally vacant from Samson's life, totally absent from Samson's life. There's a point in chapter 15 where he's in the rock Etam, E-T-A-M, and he's hiding out. It's in Judah. It's in, it's within Israel. The, the, the kingdom is not divided yet. They're all together. He's within the tribe of Judah. And 3,000 Philistine soldiers show up in Judah. And the people of Judah are like, can we help you? <laughs> what? Yes. Uh, what seems to be the problem here? <laughs> There's 3,000 of you. You look like you want to fight. And they say, we want Samson. We want to capture him. We want to bind him. We want to take him. And the response from the people of Judah is not, nope, he's our leader. He's our judge. If you want him, you got to get through us. We love him. He spent time with us. He understands us. Uh, we've submitted ourselves to his leadership, and, and we're going to protect him. Get you out of here, or we're going to fight. That's not what they said at all. You know what they said? Okay. <laughs> he's all yours. Take him. Just take him. And you go, wow, they're disloyal. Well, yes, but their disloyalty is owed in part to his failure to invest in them, his failure to develop any kind of relationship with them. And he didn't invest in them because he didn't think he needed them. And he didn't think he needed them because he thought he could do everything all by himself. He's puffed up and thinking of himself above that which is written and living a rogue life. And now he did break out. Of, amazingly, he broke out of that situation, even despite the 3,000. His own people helped bind him. Uh, and he said, as long as you guys don't fall on me, I'll go along, knowing full well that whatever they bound him with, he was going to break out of. But as he won some victories and got some deliverances and continued to attribute them to himself, he became increasingly sure that nothing was ever going to get him, that he could break out of anything. He could get himself out of any situation. Was he right about that? No, he could not get himself out of every situation. And that becomes apparent Later on, he's haughty and arrogant. In his haughtiness, he's setting himself up for a fall. And you know the story. You've read your Bible many times, and you've heard the story many times, and you read Judges 14 and 15, and you see his haughtiness, and you see his arrogance growing, and you know what's coming, but he didn't. And pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. He had a big fall coming. A big fall was coming around the corner. He's so haughty that he... <laughs> He gets to the point where he knows that Delilah has conspired with his enemies. He knows that she is their informant. He knows that enemy Philistines are just a few feet away in the same bedroom that he's in. But yet he thinks he can get out of that. He thinks he can handle that. He thinks that, that even if they are about to pounce on him, the moment he slips up, he just thinks, I can handle that. Whatever happens, I'll handle it. I'll be fine. And, and he's living on the edge. He's just willing to live on the edge. You know, if we're wise and humble and we say, all right, there's temptation to sin, I want to stay away from that. 
There's this fence that God says, okay, here's the fence, and anything on this side of the fence, this is sin, and you're not to do that. When we're wise and humble, we say, all right, here's the fence. I'm going to make my own fence over here. I'm not going anywhere near that fence. I don't even want to take the chance because because it, it, the closer I get to it, the more drawn I'm going to be. And I'm just going to stay, I want to stay right here where everything around me is fine and, and approved of God. But when you say, I'm just going to build my house on the fence. I'm just going to get up on top of that fence like a gymnast. And I'm just going to try to do cartwheels down the fence. And don't worry, I got it. I won't fall. No, you're already there. You're already halfway over. And the overconfidence is, I can handle it. I'll be fine. You can't. You're going to fall onto the other side. I mean, can I, I can take fire into my bosom and not be burned. That's what Pro, Proverbs says. That's a very foolish man. I think I, I'll still be safe if I take this fire. I won't burn myself. Yes, you will. And it's pride that causes us to think that. She pressed him daily. Look at verse 16. It came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words. Daily. How many consecutive days was he there? Or had he moved in? Are they cohabitating at that point? Does all of his stuff, does he have his own closet there? Is he living there? How many days is he, if not, how many days does he keep going back? Obviously, he's very comfortable falling asleep there. That that takes place here as well. So why stay under that line of questioning, under all the pouting and all the nagging and vexing? Why stay under that barrage of, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. Why not just say, I'm going out to the store (laughs) and not come back? (laughs) <laughs> but she keeps pestering and badgering him. And with every fake answer he gives, he's getting a little closer to spilling the beans. He gives these three fake outs. And he, the first one he starts off with is already a little bit like hair. It's like he's, he's a little dense. He's not very good at misleading. Oh, he, she, knows, she doesn't know that, the, that, it, that if the hair is gone, then he'll lose his power. She doesn't know that. But he says, how about you find a green hair-like substance, long, stringy, strandy things. Tie me up with one of those. Nope, just kidding, it's not that. Okay, try some ropes. Well, rope and hair look a little bit alike. And then he gets to the third fake out, and he's, tie my hair up. <laughs> like, you're getting her closer and closer to exactly what the answer is. He, you might as well just come out and say it. He, he's living dangerously close to the edge. And I read it wondering, did he want to get, did he want to get caught? Was it driveways? He one of those people that just cannot handle knowing a secret. He just, it was driving him nuts. He had the telltale heart, boom, 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 and he just had to get it out. Somebody told him uh, he had a hot piece of information that's just burning, and he just can't. I've been keeping this secret all this time, and he just, just finally just wanted to get it out. So he breaks down, and he tells her all his heart, maybe because he was so addicted to whatever it is that she may have been withholding from him during that process of extracting the information that he just was so hooked on what she may have been withholding that he could not, he just said, I've got to have it. And I'll tell you anything you want to hear to satisfy what I would like to satisfy. Makes me think of Esau. I'm hungry and I'll give you a birthright. I don't care. Blessing. I don't care. Um, I just am faint and your pottage of lentils is looking so good to me right now. I'll tell you anything. I'll give you anything. And that's, that's a person who's hooked. And so, and so he does break down. And he tells her all his heart. Put yourself, <clears throat> pardon me. Put yourself in Samson's position for a moment. After you had broken down and spilled the beans and coughed up the information, they now know how to get you. They now know what what will cause your power to be taken, and you'll be as any other man. And you know they hate you and want to kill you and torture you, and they're right there. Even be, for me, even before the hair is cut, knowing that for me, knowing that they know how to do it, I would flee right then and there. I'd be like, I'm out of here. I'm not, I'm not taking the chance that you'll get to me and now you know what to do. So I think I'm just, I'm gone. I'm going, I might not go to my last hiding spot, the rock Etum. I'm going to some other rock. But he, he's, so, he's so filled with pride that he actually thinks that, that even if they know how to get him, that because he still has the hair and still has the power, that he'll be able to fend them off. Well, they might know how to do it, but I'll just stop them from doing it. I'll pick up the house again. I'll pick up the gates again. I'll pick up another lion. I'll pick up another jawbone. Even though they they know exactly what needs to be done, well, I still have it. I still have the power. I'll keep them from getting to me. 
He's living so close to the edge. He, he thought he could wiggle his way out of everything. And, and you know what he doesn't do? The moment the, the secret's out, he doesn't pray. He's not like, Lord, I now gave them some information that can hurt me. Can you just, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have told, I shouldn't have said. Can you just give me a little bit of extra power just to keep, keep me protected and keep them away from getting my hair? Can you do that for me? You don't find that on record, him doing that. It's actually, I think, kind of funny <laughs> and kind of comical that what, what does him in? Falling asleep is what does him in. You've got this man who has killed a lion. How many people in this world can say they've killed a lion with their bare hands? Anybody? On, this, on earth right now, maybe one or two, maybe some skilled African somewhere, I don't know. You've got somebody who's killed a thousand people in one outing. You've got somebody who's picked up city gates. And what is it that does him in? Falling asleep. He just fell asleep, and that's what did him in. Falling asleep. Why fall asleep? Because he's way too comfortable in a place where a child of God should never be comfortable. Child of God should never be comfortable where he is. Should be uncomfortable. Should be very uncomfortable. But when you've been uh, living and partaking and living in sin so long, you're just comfortable in it. And he's got no alertness. He's got no vigilance. He's got no discomfort. He, he's just right at home in sin. He's just right at home partaking in those things so much so that he can just conk out. And so you wonder, did he trust Delilah that much that she knows how to disarm him and he's still willing to, did he just think she probably won't use this information to hurt me? Well, he already has experiential proof that, it, that she's used bad information to try to hurt him. Of course, she's going to use good information to try to hurt him. So it's not that he has so much trust in her. It's just his famous last words. I can handle it. Now, I, I, I wrote, the, the Bible doesn't say that, but I'm, I'm describing the attitude that we see that is described, and it's just, I can handle anything. And I mean, famous last words, I can handle it. How many people said, I got this, it's fine, I, I'm fine, I got it, I can handle it. And that's their last statement before uh, it becomes evident that they couldn't handle it. I, and so that's, that's number two. Number three, so how, uh, the tragedy of disarmament, number three, by taking power for granted. By taking power for granted. So that's imagined invincibility and then taking power for granted. When we take what God has given us, our, our talents, our abilities, our, our, our strengths, when we take those things for granted and attribute them to our, ourselves, we get flippant about them. We fail to see their value and then we lose our seriousness. We lose our gravity. We don't really appreciate them. We assume we'll always have them. And that gives us this, we've got this sense of entitlement. When we think, this is just me. It's not from God. It's just because I'm so special and I've always been like this and I've always had this. And we begin to be very, th that sense of entitlement produces a frivolity. It produces a levity where we just don't take them very seriously. We think we'll always have them. A and we see that throughout Samson's life. He's always joking. He's always teasing. He's always, he's always playful. He's always playing. And life is a game. Everything is just game, just fun and games for Samson. Everything's a game to him. The Bible says it is sport to a fool to do mischief. It is sport to a fool to do mischief. Instead of trying to be, you look at his life, it's the moment of his wedding. The, the girl in Timna, I mean, the first woman that he's involved with, it's wedding time. A wedding is supposed to be kind of sober and grave. Like, I remember my wedding. I mean, I always like to joke around and goof off with my buddies, but... But, I mean, it's serious. There's things that need to be in place. And I don't want to, there's, there's a serious um, vibe at a wedding. And Samson at his wedding, he's got riddles going and he's placing wagers and bets and talking about clothes and I can kill 30 people and what will you give me? That, that, he's not thinking about being a decent husband. He's just not taking it seriously. He's not taking his, his wedding and his marriage seriously. And he, he continues that. He's playing around with fireworks and playing around with foxes and causes the death of his wife and her father-in-law, terrible death, graphic death. And you'd think, why? Why did they die? Because of Samson's fun and games. Because he's playing around with everything, just always playing, never taking anything seriously, so much so that he's causing deaths. And even that doesn't sober him up. Everything's a play thing. He thinks he's invincible. He doesn't take threats seriously. And so he doesn't take the notion that he could ever lose his power seriously. And everything in life is a toy. The lion is just a toy for me to play with. 
The guests at the wedding are just toys for me to play with. All What were women to Samson? Toys to play with. Everything is a toy. And now he's toying with Delilah. And he's teasing. Oh, this will do it. Ha, <laughs> just kidding. Psych, fake. No, it won't. Oh, this will do it. <laughs> Why don't you try that? We'll see what happens with that. That'll be fun. Ooh, failed again. <laughs> you guys, look at you. Just having fun. Making sport. Fun and games. But there was going to be a time when it wasn't going to be fun and games anymore. Because you fast forward to him with the haircut, the power gone, locked up, chained up. It gets real when some guy dressed like an executioner comes your way and he's got a hot poker or some rusty knife. And you wonder, what's he going to do to me? And the answer is, I'm coming for your eyeballs. I'm going to gouge your eyeballs out right now. That's not fun and games anymore. And he wishes he had taken some things a little bit more seriously. He wishes he had been a little bit more grave. There was never a point when God charged him to keep it secret. Isn't that interesting that you don't see, at least in this record, that God had said to him, now you can have this power as long as you don't tell anybody about your hair being cut. And so did he disobey God necessarily? Did he sin when he coughed up the information that led to his disarmament? I don't really know the answer to that question, but I can tell you that it certainly was an indiscretion. It certainly was a failure to conceal sensitive information. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 2, discretion shall preserve thee. And so what's the opposite? Indiscretion shall cause you not to be preserved. And this indiscretion lost his preservation of his power and his eyes and his liberty. Discretion shall preserve thee. And he failed to keep discreet something that ought to have been kept discreet. He that hath knowledge spareth his words. A prudent man concealeth knowledge. A talebearer revealeth secrets, but he that is of a faithful spirit concealeth the matter. Sometimes there's TMI. Sometimes there's too much information. Sometimes we talk too much and shoot off at the mouth and tell people too many things that didn't need to be discussed and ought not to have been brought up, and it comes back to bite us, and we're no longer preserved. And if we had discretion, if we had been discreet, we'd have been kept from some terrible things and some uncomfortable things. And he found that out. When you don't appreciate what's been given to you, you don't take anything seriously, you play fast and loose with anything, then you start to play fast and loose even with information. And information is no different from people. I mess with, I toy with, I play with the things I know, the things I, I talk about with people. And when you take something for granted, and you feel like you're entitled to it, you're more likely to abuse it. We abuse things that we don't really appreciate, that we just, we just take for granted. And there's abuse of his power. She keeps asking him where his great strength lies. And, you know, there was a way that he could have answered that question honestly and simply and truthfully and still not disclosed what led to his demise. What would that answer have been? God. That's all he had to say. Where is your great strength lie? Where is your great strength lie? Where is your great strength lie? How can you do this? God. God endowed me with this great power and God in his grace and mercy has chosen me to, to bestow these amazing things on. I'm so thankful to be used of him. He's just treated me to a privilege that no one else has been treated to. God's the one that, that that's the answer. It's God. So why did he not give that answer? Because had he given that answer, it would have raised another question. Okay. And maybe this was only in his own spirit. Maybe, maybe Delilah wouldn't have asked him this. Okay. If it's God that's given you this power, why are you sinning against him in this illicit relationship? He didn't want to think about that answer. And so he didn't get, well, it's God. He's not thinking about God. He's thinking about himself. And isn't it amazing how surprised he is that he lost his power? He wished not. He didn't realize what had happened after he fell asleep and his hair was cut. He did not realize, I'll shake myself as at other times. Now, I can understand that if you're fast asleep, and somebody breaks your legs, you'll feel that, and you'll wake up, and you'll know your legs are broken. But if you've got long hair, and somebody cuts your hair, you know, you're probably not going to feel that. I've never had any prank played on me like that, but I would think that it might, if they do it lightly, it won't wake you up. And when he comes to and wakes up, he's not looking at a mirror, so he doesn't realize that his hair has been cut. So from a physiological standpoint, I can understand why he didn't realize that he had lost his power, but it's just that overconfidence. I'll just shake myself like as at other times. I've already told how I can be disarmed. And then he's shocked and surprised to find out that people who already tried to take it from him had done so again with good information. He's surprised by that. Hmm. 
If they've been trying to do this with bad information, I bet when they finally get good information, they'll just not do anything with it. Not likely, not going to happen. But that's what he's thinking. He's out of it. He's out of tune with reality. It's naive. He's actually surprised to find that it's gone. How does a child of God become so oblivious? How does a child of God who at other times had lived by faith, how can one of us become so oblivious in life that we're just out of it like that, that we don't know what's been done, even though, of course, that was going to happen? We get out of touch with reality when we're out of touch with God. And when we spend time with God and we're close with God, he gives us a vigilance. He gives us a wherewithal. He gives us a sense of where the danger is and where the troubles are when we're close with him. But when we're out of touch with God, we're out of touch with reality. We're out of touch with our atmosphere. We're out of touch with the problems that surround us. We don't pay attention to them. What an indictment that he could be so unaware of those things. Because if you spend enough time communing closely with the Lord, if you live in regular fellowship with the Lord, if you try to pray without ceasing, if you try to be right with God throughout the day, if you try to keep short accounts with God, if you open your day and you pray every day, you're used to your Lord being close. You know when you're not. You know when you're not right with God. You have a sensitivity to it. You know that there's some distance and there's some sin that needs to be confessed for your fellowship to be restored. It's obvious to you. And so what does it say about somebody that can't even tell when it's gone? Somebody that can't even tell when the power is gone. You spend so much time regularly and routinely out of fellowship with God, your sense of whether you're close or far is all thrown out of whack and all distorted. He's got no clue. His, the Lord had departed from him and he wist not. Didn't even realize it. He learned the hard way to stop taking what was given to him for granted. It is often when something is taken from us that we finally, we finally realize how good it was. And it's just a needless tragedy when, we loot, when God takes something from us and now we don't have it anymore and then we start appreciating it. And what a good reminder that is to try to appreciate and praise God for everything that we have so that we don't have to learn that lesson the hard way by having it taken from us. Till it's too late. I love God's fitting justice and poetic justice on display again. We've heard it, you've probably heard it preached many times that his problem with it was the eyes. He saw the woman in Timnath and he struggled with visual, and that's what, what drew him into temptation and sin. And so God brings it to pass that the eyes are taken out. That's fitting justice, poetic justice. How about the word sport? Look at verse uh, chapter 16, verse 25. And it came to pass when their hearts were merry that they said, call for Samson, that he may make us sport. Samson spent so much of his life sporting and joking and playing games, teasing with Delilah and teasing with everybody, making sport, and now he's sport for the Philistines. He is sport to them. He, I'm just into amusement, now he's their amusement. I just want recreation, he's their recreation. Fitting justice. And then he's rotting in fetters of brass, probably ruining the day. When I went down into the Valley of Sorek, I just wish I had never met Delilah, probably going back in his mind when they first started talking and when he first started going down that road. I wish I just had been somewhere else doing something else. Then I could still have my strength. Then I wouldn't be in this prison house. Then I could still have my eyes and I could still see. I wish I never met Delilah. And don't you wish he could come back from the grave and preach that message to all of our young people, to all of America, to all of the world and say, Man, I, I've lived it. you got to stay away from her house. I can tell you to stay away. He sure wished he had because he lost his power, lost his eyes. And what can God take from us? God can take that we take for granted, that we think is because of us, your car, your job, your bank account, your spouse, your life, all these things taken for granted. But the good news is this, is that even the things that God has to take from us to get our attention and we lose them, he can still give them back. And he, he, at least for a brief moment, he gave Samson power back for one last victory. And you know, we're not going to look back at it. You know the story, but, but why not ask if you've been, uh, you've been chastened and you have taken something for granted. God has taken it from you and you appreciate it. You can still ask for it back. He could have asked for his eyes back. Is God able to pop some eyes back into his head? Sure. God could do that if he wanted to. But I'll, leave, I'll finish with just a couple questions. Things I wonder. How is it that the Philistines let his hair regrow? They knew, they knew what gave him his strength. Why didn't they give him a haircut every day? I would have. 
I wouldn't have taken any chances. Was there a bad information system within the framework of the administration of the Philistines that, that those that actually control him never got the intel that don't let his hair grow? Because <laughs> it's that, it's that, that, that's what happens. You also wonder, was Delilah present at the party of the 3,000 when he pulled the pillars down? In, usually in videos, movies, she's depicted as being present. We don't know, but was she? I'd be curious to know the answer to that question. I also wonder about the, the question of suicide that's brought up a little bit there. Not that God ever blesses suicide, but it's interesting the way Samson finally prays and says that I may die. Will you give me my strength back so that I can give another one last victory? And he says that I may die. And, and is that a rare case of God somewhat blessing suicide? Or is it that there's, some self, there's finally a little bit of selfless humility that Samson says, it, it, you know, I want to give one last victory for God's people so bad, I'll even go down with the ship if I have to? I don't know. I don't know, but I know he's in heaven by faith. So we'll be able to ask him some of those questions and ask the Lord some of those questions uh, when we get there. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for all the